Coming up on Arirang News, South Korea's exports declined for an 11th month in a row, hit by the U.S.-China trade war. Consumer inflation, meanwhile, now out of negative territory and zero flat. North Korea claims to have perfected a new multiple rocket launcher with yesterday's launches. The weapon is understood to be bigger and more accurate than previous versions. And we visit some of Korea's most beautiful scenic destinations as the autumn foliage reaches its peak, hiking and all kinds of activities at the country's mountains and lakes. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. North Korea is claiming that with yesterday's launch of two missiles, it has perfected what it calls a super large multiple rocket launcher. Military sources in the south say the way the missiles were launched over land does show the North has confidence in the weapon. Kim ji reports. Boasting its latest launch, North Korea said it has successfully tested a super large multiple rocket launcher. A state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Friday the firing served as an opportunity to verify the perfection of its firing system. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was not present at the test firing but was reported to be satisfied with the launch. A South Korean military source confirmed the launch appeared to be a test fire of a super-large multiple rocket launcher. But Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff said it has no plans to release further details to prevent exposure of South Korea's capability to collect security-related information. The Joint Chiefs said Thursday that the North had launched two short-range projectiles from the northwestern region towards the East Sea. They flew roughly 370 kilometers with a maximum altitude of around 90 kilometers. The projectiles flew across land, which experts say normally demonstrates the regime's confidence that the test will be successful. This is the third time this year that the North had test-fired a super-large multiple rocket launcher. South Korean military sources and experts say the accuracy of the projectile improves when the size of the launcher is bigger. The North had test-fired two projectiles from a super-large rocket launcher in September. One of them is believed to have missed its target. The U.S. is also monitoring the situation. A spokesperson for the Pentagon told Seoul Base Yonan News late Thursday the U.S. is looking into the latest launch while closely working with its allies South Korea and Japan for more information. Kim ji Arirang News. South Korean President Moon Jae-in's diplomatic schedule has been shaken up by the cancellation of the APEC summit in Chile. That summit would have seen him meet with several key world leaders and make progress on the issues of peace and denuclearization. Shin se has the details. An unexpected change for South Korean leader Moon Jae-in in regards to his diplomatic schedule for the month of November. It had been confirmed by South Korea's presidential office that the president would visit Thailand for ASEAN-related meetings, travel to the APEC summit in Chile, and make a stop in Mexico on his way there. There is also the Korea-ASEAN special summit in the country's southern port city of Busan toward the end of the month. But with Wednesday's announcement by the Chilean president that he was scrapping the APEC summit in Santiago due to intensifying anti-government protests, a decision also endorsed by the APEC secretariat, the doors to President Boon's planned sideline meetings with other world leaders also slammed shut. Although South Korea's presidential office has said it would closely monitor the cancellation, reviving the APEC summit at this late stage looks highly unlikely. It was thought the South Korean president would meet with U.S. President Donald Trump in Chile for talks on speeding up denuclearization talks with North Korea. There could have also been sideline talks with the leaders of China and Russia, both deemed to be critical partners in efforts related to the North. On top of that, efforts to soothe Seoul's relations with Japan were also expected to be on the cards amid their trade spat. With a termination date of their bilateral intelligence sharing pact known as GSOMIA scheduled for just days after the now cancelled APEC summit, there was speculation the leaders of South Korea and Japan would hold sideline talks in Chile. The sudden change in plans leaves a lot of unknowns in major diplomatic projects. What remains intact, however, is the Boon administration's stern resolve in overcoming what the president had expressed as the last hurdle in the denuclearization talks and its unchanging stance in repairing ties with Japan through dialogue. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. 
On his way to Chile for the APEC summit, President Moon was going to make an official visit to Mexico, but that's now been called off as well. The president was going to be in Mexico for two days for bilateral talks with President Andres Manuel López Obrador. Blue House spokesperson Ko Min Jung told reporters on Friday that the decision was made after discussions with the Mexican government, which expressed its understanding. The South Korean authorities have found what they believe to be the fuselage of a firefighting helicopter that crashed into the sea last night. Seven people were on board, including one patient, and all of them are still missing. A full-scale search and rescue operation has been underway, with the Defense Ministry dispatching 45 personnel along with patrol boats and aircraft. The helicopter crashed near Korea's easternmost islets of Tokto at around 11.30 p.m., just three minutes after takeoff. President Moon has ordered a general inspection of that particular model of helicopter. It's been a year since South Korea's Supreme Court ordered Japanese companies to compensate the Koreans they used for forced labor during World War II. They've refused to cooperate, but in the meantime, a contemporary document from the Japanese government has been released showing that hundreds of thousands of people who were sent to work were sent against their will. Our Kim jae reports. With the Seoul Tokyo dispute still raging over the South Korean Supreme Court's compensation ruling last year on Japan's wartime labor, the National Archives of Korea on Thursday released documents that proved Japan forcibly mobilized Korean labor during Japan's colonial rule of Korea. The original report, titled Report on the Survey on Labor Resources, contains the result of a study by Japan on workers that could be taken overseas. The documents show the Japanese government general of Korea instructed the governors of provinces to analyze available labor resources from March to September in 1940. Accordingly, a survey was conducted on men aged between 20 to 45 and women aged between 12 to 19. We believe the reason why the women's ages were limited to 12 to 19 years old was to mobilize them as military comfort women. The results of the analysis were also included in the report. A total of 263,000 people, 242,000 men and 20,000 women were willing to leave their homes to work jobs other than farming. But the archive says the number of Koreans under Japan's plan to forcibly mobilize labor resources was actually 714,000 people in 1944, substantially more than the 263,000 people originally recorded. The results show that after 1942, Koreans were not voluntarily mobilized. They were forcibly taken as wartime labor. The archives plan to release the information on its website of 140,000 workers listed on the employee list and health insurance book before the end of the year. Kim Jae-hee, Arirang News. The city of Jecheon in Chungcheongbukdo province is known for a beautiful harmony between its mountains and the nearby water. Now that we're near the peak of autumn, the views there are even more spectacular. Our Yi kyung is standing by in Jecheon to bring you some live pictures. kyung how's it looking there? Hi, Devin. I'm cruising through Cheongpung Lake in the city of Jecheon. And as you can see, mountains are changing their colors into the autumn hues, the reds, oranges, and yellows. And the place where I'm standing right now offers one of the most breathtaking view of that autumn foliage. Now to give you our exact location, we're getting close to Oksumbong Peak. It's one of the 10 scenic views of Jecheon with a huge stone wall coming out of the middle of the vast waters. This is the highlight of the ferry ride where you can enjoy the most beautiful scenery of the lake. Also during the two-hour of course, the ferry glides past Gudangbong Peak, one of the eight scenic views of Tanyang City, as well as Oksum Bridge. All these natural sites are at most impressive during the autumn because of the colorful leaves. And if you come here to visit the lake, you can also check out other tourist attractions along the lakeside. There is Cheongpung Cultural Heritage Complex, where you can see Korean traditional architecture and artifacts. And on top of Bibongsan Mountain, you can look down on the entire city. Also, you can enjoy some extreme sports at Cheongpung Land, which is located right next to the cruise ship boarding platform. And all these sites are located next to each other and they're easy to visit. And people here say that Cheongpong Lake is the perfect place to start your tour of Jecheon City. But if you can't make it here, there are other places to see the autumn leaves in other parts of the country. And we normally say the autumn foliage is at its peak when 80% of mountains change their colors. And because it starts from uh, colder regions, it begins from the upper regions and spread down south. So places like Seonaksan, 
Kansan and Chiaksan already seeing vibrant colors, while southern regions and Jeju Island will reach their peak soon. That's all I have for now. Back to you, Devin. Last month, South Korea's exports fell again for the 11th consecutive month, mainly due to weaker chip exports and the impact of the U.S.-China trade war. To help local exporters, the trade ministry held a meeting today and unveiled a plan to help exporters with billions of dollars in financing. Yoon Jung-min has the details. Concerns are growing as South Korea's exports fell again in October for the 11th straight month amid slowing global trade. Data released by the trade ministry showed on Friday that the country's outbound shipments slumped nearly 15 percent on-year to some 46 billion U.S. dollars in October. That's the biggest on-year decline this year. Semiconductor shipments have fallen 32 percent, while petroleum goods were down 23 percent. However, exports of ships went up 26 percent. Computer and biohealth product shipments also increased nearly 8 percent in October. The ministry attributed the fall in exports to sluggish semiconductor demand and the impact of the ongoing trade spat between the U.S. and China. In fact, the ministry said falling exports are a concern for all major global economies due to rising uncertainties such as trade disputes or concerns over a possible no-deal Brexit. The ministry, however, said Japan's recent export restrictions on South Korea have so far had a limited impact on Seoul. Imports also dropped around 15 percent on-year in October to some $41 billion. With imports and exports both declining, the country posted a trade surplus of some $5.4 billion. Aside from the U.S.-China dispute, Korea is heavily affected by semiconductors, which is why exports have been falling for 11 months. Now the demand for chips is at its lowest, but watchers say the demand is expected to rise in the future. On the same day, the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy held a meeting with trade and industry groups to discuss export conditions. There, Minister Song yun mo unveiled a government plan to put more than $51 billion into trade finance in the fourth quarter to support local exporters. The ministry also promised to support overseas marketing and invest more than $257 billion in the future industries, including chips, biohealth and future cars. The ministry expects the trade to turn around from this month and begin to really pick up next quarter. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. South Korea's consumer inflation had, for the first time earlier this year, turned negative, leading to fears of deflation. But for October, it was back up to zero. Officials say they don't expect it to go back into minus territory in the near future. Hong Yu has the details. Statistics Korea says the consumer inflation rate saw a slight increase, but it remained at 0 percent compared to last year. The consumer price index for October has gone up by 0.2 percent compared to September to 105.46. And compared to the same month last year, it remains the same. In September, the nation's consumer price growth had dropped into the negative range for the first time on record at minus 0.4 percent compared to the same month last year. It was also the longest period that South Korea has seen a consumer inflation rate below 1 percent since the 10 months from February to November 2015. The growth was lower than what everyone had anticipated because the economy still remains stagnant. The low inflation rate is partly due to the low prices of supplies such as oil and agricultural goods. Core inflation excluding agricultural and petroleum product prices rose 0.8 percent from a year earlier. And utility prices rose 1.5 percent on year in October, while prices of agricultural, livestock and fisheries products fell 3.8 percent. But Statistics Korea says the reversing base effect in upcoming New Year will increase prices for certain sectors, so consumer prices won't fall into negative growth in the near future. Hong Yu, Arirang News. Time now for an in-depth look at the market news on this Friday. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Song Su Young, professor of business at Chungang University. Dr. Song, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me again. Yeah. 
Well, a lot of factors weighing on the markets right now. The APEC summit being canceled, which is where the U.S.-China trade deal might have been signed. Uh, the U.S. grounding Chinese-made drones because of concerns about spying. What's happening in the markets today? Uh, as far as today's, uh, the S&P 500 uh, dropped a little bit, uh, which has reached the highest point in uh, Thursday. Then the problem is... Uh, uh, right now, the U.S. economy, particularly in the stock price, has soared too much, and uh, now they are in the process of adjustment. So I don't uh, worry too much about that. But however, particularly for the U.S., the manufacturing activity is clearly shows the declining signal. That's why the Federal Reserve Bank decided to, uh, as a pre preemptive uh, measure, to uh, decrease the federal funds rate. And in uh, Asian market, Asia Pacific market, there is uh, response was relatively stable. That's, that's what I know as far as. Yeah, most uh, markets here in Asia up slightly today, except for the Nikkei. Uh, now, meanwhile, the uh, Chinese Communist Party's wrapped up its plenary meeting in Beijing. This was, of course, behind mm -hmm. closed doors, uh, but they've released a communique. What kind of measures mm -hmm. did they discuss and what implications, if any, are there for the global economy? Uh, I think they are going to focus on the uh, domestic market, and they uh, would like to re re maintain the firm stance against uh, U.S. and China trade deals, because uh, cur currently the President Trump is quite in a, some uh, unfavorable favorable situation because the uh, House of Congress has passed uh, uh, the impe impeachment inquiry for him. So that's why. Uh, I believe that uh, Chinese government believe time is on their side, and then they rather uh, making a, uh, some concession. They would like to retain current position and then wait until the the U.S. Uh, President Trump has been has offered some kind of the uh, uh, offer to the for the settlement of the U.S.-China dispute. So. Uh, to that regard, the Chinese uh, position is currently they are not in a hurry. And, however, still they are concerned about uh, some declining gross rate and the manufacturing activities in the domestic market. I think that is uh, quite an issue for them. Yeah, on the impeachment front, at least uh, large, in large part, that should be over by the end of the year, um, either way. But the uh, Telegraph in the UK has an interesting mm -hmm. article asking whether South Korea uh, might become the new Japan in terms of its economy. Mm -hmm. And not in a good way, though, referencing a potential secular crisis worse than uh, Japan's so-called lost decades. Do you think that's the situation we're actually facing? And if so, what can be done about it? Yeah, actually, I look over that uh, article and uh, news report in uh, the Telegraph, and uh, I I think the interview is uh, described the cur uh, the current situation of Korean economy is quite uh, misleading and uh, misjudging. I believe uh, the reason is because the current crisis is uh, not comparable with the uh, 1997 uh, economic crisis. At that time, the crisis took place only in East Asia. It doesn't have, it did not have any negative impact even on the Japan. But right now, Korean economy uh, suffered from the, some external factors such as the U.S.-China dispute and the, some sudden stop of the export of the important uh, materials from Japan. However, now we have a domestic issue is because we have uh, some declining birth rate and that is a major factor for the stagnant uh, Korean economy right now. And uh, I hope the externality could, Im could be improved in, a, uh, in the meantime, but uh, as long as the U.S.-China trade dispute has been resolved and then we could uh, uh, rejuvenate the relationship between the U uh, Korea and uh, uh, Japan. However, North Korea's uh, stance is uh, right now is very uh, unstable or uh, subject to uncertainty. That's why we have uh, some headwind politically, but economically, uh, because relative to other OECD countries' performance, our country's performance is uh, not as bad as the others. So to that regard, 
we don't have to worry up to fear is fear itself so we don't have to fear that we are going to another round or phase of imf crisis which is similar to the 1997 uh, nor do we have to concern about that however we have to focus on the how to rebuild some domestic demand and how to uh, incur some uh, kind of innovation that could be used as a future prosperity and uh, how to uh, resolve the, some inequality of the income and the wealth. Uh, that is the, some uh, daunting job for the current government. But the other things are, I don't think that is, uh, from the political, politically right now, the, the current government could be in the, some favorable position in, uh, right now. Well, it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, we'll have to save mm -hmm. it for next time, though. Uh, Dr. Song, thanks so much for your insights today. Yeah, thank you. Now, South Korea's prime minister says Korea is working hand in hand with China to combat fine dust pollution. Also, during a meeting today, he proposed a set of countermeasures to cut the nation's fine dust concentration by 35 percent in the next five years. Park Hee Joon reports. Prime Minister Lee Nak-yeon says South Korea is closely cooperating with China, a major source of fine dust particles and yellow dust, to tackle fine dust pollution. And he says the results of joint research by Korea, China and Japan will be released within this month. The joint response with the Chinese government is ongoing. We are reaffirming their determination through high-level talks and are carrying out joint studies and reduction projects. Results from joint research by Korea, China and Japan on the movement of fine dust will be revealed in the middle of this month. The Special Committee for Fine Dust Reduction held its third meeting on Friday. The meeting centered on a five-year plan to cut the average annual fine dust concentration to 16 micrograms per cubic meter from the current 26 micrograms by 2024. It's the first official plan since the Special Act on Particulate Matter Reduction and Management took effect in February. 17 billion U.S. dollars over five years will be allocated to the plan, which includes strengthening international cooperation and ensuring public health. The committee also hopes to effectively respond during the worst season for fine dust between December and March. Measures include suspending coal power generation and regulating the use of grade 5 emission vehicles in the capital area, mostly high emission diesel cars. It also plans to establish a private and public joint inspection team of around 8,000 people and use drones and other high-tech equipment to monitor the situation. Prime Minister Yi emphasized the importance of action. He called on all ministries to work together to tackle the issue, while also asking the public to actively participate in these efforts, remembering they're not just victims, but contributors to the fine dust problem at the same time. Park Hee-jun, News. Samsung Electronics celebrated its 50th anniversary at its headquarters today in Suwon. Kim Hye-sung reports. 90 billion U.S. dollars in exports last year, number six in global brand value, number one in goods, including TVs and smartphones. Samsung Electronics South Korea's tech giant marked its 50th anniversary on Friday. At the ceremony held at Samsung Digital City, attended by hundreds of employees and the heads of company divisions, Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong, the company's de facto leader through a video message, thanked Samsung employees for their dedication and emphasized the company's commitment to build on its legacy and make it to a hundred. He added that Samsung will contribute to global society through innovative technologies, pointing to innovation, change, and social contribution as three key goals heading forward. Founded in 1969, the company started with just 36 employees producing black and white TVs, but has since grown into a global powerhouse. Innovation and challenge has been the driving force of Samsung Electronics, which entered the semiconductor business in 1983. Chairman Lee Gon-hee in 1993 famously told employees to change everything except for your wife and your children to improve its electronics products. Since then, Samsung Electronics started producing mobile phones, its TVs, refrigerators and semiconductors now top the global markets. As of 2019, Samsung's exports increased from $100 million in 1979 to $90 billion last year, accounting for around 15 percent of Korea's total exports. Sales hit $208 billion last year. 
Despite the firm's success, Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong, the only son of Chairman Lee Kuan-hee, faces numerous challenges, including the ongoing U.S.-China trade dispute, the need to find new growth engines, and a retrial on corruption charges that landed him in prison in 2017. In April, Vice Chairman Lee unveiled plans to become world's number one in non-memory chips by investing a total of $116 billion by 2030. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. That brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.